Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our World of Ideas lectures to lecture number five over Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Origin of Civil Society from the Social Contract of 1762. Now, without question, a couple of observations right away for your notes. Without question, this is going to be one of the more demanding essays that you have read in your high school and early college career. Secondly, this may be one of the most influential essays that we will ever read. Notice your date, 1762, a few years later, 1776, and of course Jefferson uh, and the Declaration of Independence, a text that we'll study actually uh, in contiguity with this text here in a bit. Now the first line of this, uh, of this essay is extremely important and of course very famous. It goes like this, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. We're uh, working with the uh, Gerald Hopkins uh, translation from Social Contract Essays by Locke Hume and Rousseau. Uh, this, of course, will raise a very interesting question. Man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. Raises profound kind of questions that we'll obviously have to deal with, like how do people who are born free lose their freedom? Like, how does that even happen? Uh, and we'll maybe have to ask some important questions about that. But now. Go back to a few of our assumptions. The first and, and really significant is that my assumption in your studying with me now in Lecture 5 over Rousseau is that you've been with me for the World of Ideas Lectures 1 and 2, Introductory, and then, uh, and then Lectures uh, 3 over Lhasa and 4 over Machiavelli's Prince. If you haven't been with us, hit LearnStrong.net, find the AP folder, the World of Ideas folder, and make sure that you study those, because I'm going to be making references to some of the stuff that we've already said. The other thing that we assume is always an understanding of our learning theory, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and that's always hypercritical for us. The next assumption for us is that you're aware that we use this term annotation or active reading or engaging in some kind of a dialogue with the text, and we do that, of course, in our three levels of reading. At level one, what does the text say? This is our summary level of reading. Now, we got 62 paragraphs here in this essay. The, and, and we're asking that you will do a paragraph outline, which means for every outline, all 62 of them, you want to write down one or two or maybe even three important concepts to help you understand at level one just what this text is about. At level two, we ask, what does it mean? Okay, once we've summarized it, we're going to ask, what does it mean? At 2A, we'll begin, of course, with our big five. Namely, what does this text say about epistemology, the study of knowledge and what we can know? What does this text say about sociology, the, the, uh, the idea of, of groups, as well as psychology, as well as ontology, the question of who we are. We just read, man is born free. That's an interesting concept. And finally, theodicy, the notion that there's pain and suffering and evil in the world. How do you account for it, and what are we going to do with it? Of course, at 2B, we're going to ask rhetorical questions, and the rhetorical techniques we'll get into in a moment here. Finally, at level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, obviously, we're going to ask about our study of Lotz already and Machiavelli and the Prince. We're going to try and relate it to some of the stuff that we're reading here with Rousseau. And obviously, we're going to take a look at some of the stuff that Jefferson has to say in the Declaration of Independence in the next lecture. My final assumption here is that you've read this material on your own and that you're coming to me then with some kind of help. Let's begin, as we always like to do, with some brief, brief biography. This will be possibly one of the first exposures that you as high school students and, and first year college students will have had to the great French, uh, Swiss French thinker Rousseau. His date, 1712 to 1778, if you're looking for a round date, 1750 will work rather well for you. Again, as we said, he's Swiss. Interestingly, because of some experiences in his life that I won't get into, he actually goes from being a Calvinist Protestant to a Roman Catholic, and there's a lot of scholars that say, if you're really going to study closely the work of Rousseau, you've got to factor some of, the, some of that transition in, uh, in, into your interpretation of Rousseau. Ultimately, he ends up leaving Switzerland, he goes to Paris, he writes an important first essay that was actually an essay contest, he wins, and then almost immediately overnight he becomes really famous, and then later infamous. In 1762, he published his social contract, part of a uh, never completed longer work on uh, political systems. And ultimately, this publication will lead to his exile from, um, uh, from, uh, from his homeland. And ultimately, Rousseau will then uh, write 
in reaction to some degree to Hobbes and the view that Hobbes has in Leviathan. We're going to see some of this even in this, in this uh, essay today. Rousseau was more interested, put this in your notes, and this is what makes him a very romantic thinker. He was more interested in the ought side of the is-ought dichotomy than the is side of the is-ought dichotomy. In other words, go back to our comments in Machiavelli's Prince, that is to say, he was way more interested in the way the world ought to be than the way the world is. Machiavelli, of course, says, dude, I'm not interested in the way the world ought to be. I'm a realist, not an idealist. I want to know the way the world is. Rousseau will say, no, I'm very interested in the way the world ought to be, the way the world could be, if we could only understand why the world is the way that it is. It's an interesting idea. To that degree, Rousseau's often been called the defender of republicanism. Uh, ten years, interestingly, after his death, the French Revolution would in many ways adopt many of the concepts of the philosophy of Rousseau. Now, when we turn to his rhetoric, as uh, Jacobus will do in this chapter, Right away, we're going to see some important ideas for your notes. The first is that his method, Rousseau's method, is antagonistic. That is to say, he works against others and their views. He does this primarily, write this down as a rhetorical technique. We're going to look at it in every one of these uh, paragraphs. We're going to look at it. Analysis and examination. These are both key rhetorical techniques where he will take an idea and he'll analyze and examine it from multiple perspectives. One of the ways that he does this, and this will not sound unusual to us now that we've studied both Lao as well as Machiavelli, is his use of aphorism and analogy. For example, he's going to compare the government very early in this essay with a family. Now this will take us back to our study, of course, of Plato's Republic, where the city is like the individual, the, uh, 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 or, or, or the state is like the individual, the republic is like the individual. Those arguments from analogy we are familiar with because of our study of Republic, We'll come back to it here. Obviously, we're so very affected by the study of Plato, no question. Now, one of the things that he's going to argue against in this essay is this idea that might makes right. The Thrasymachan argument, as we talked about it in Plato's Republic 1, go back and take a look at those lectures at wordstrong.net if you're unfamiliar with that concept, and obviously the idea from Machiavelli's Prince. Now, the key in this essay is what we call the social contract. I'll just uh, want to pay attention now to the very last paragraph on page 54 of the introductory comments. Rousseau, I'm just reading with you. Rousseau concentrates on the question of man in nature or natural society. His view is that natural society is dominated by the strongest individuals, but that at the same moment natural society necessarily breaks down. We think, of course, of Golding's Lord of Flies as a classic example in literary fiction, right? Thus, in order to guarantee the rights of those who are not the strongest, the political order must change. To this degree, he's been considered a revolutionary in his thinking. Some form of association is developed, we're quoting now, for the protection of the person and property of each constituent member, end quote, by surrendering some freedom to the group as a whole, to the quote-unquote general will. The individuals in the group can expect to prosper more widely and to live more happily. According to Rousseau, the establishment of a social contract ensures the stability of this form of social society. Now let's turn uh, to brief analysis of the major sections of the origin of civil society starting on page 54. The first two paragraphs, notice, are in fact a note. We begin. Questions. What is the basis of government? This inquiry will examine human beings as they are and laws as they might be and considers justice and utility as inseparable. That's, that's hypercritical to reading Rousseau. Being a citizen and voter is enough qualification and reason to investigate the nature of public affairs. Paragraphs 1 and 2. We then come to the opening lines of social contract the subject of the first book. Let's just read it. I'm on page 55. Man is born free, and everywhere he's in change. Many a man believes himself to be the master of others who is, no less than they, a slave. How did this change take place? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? To this question, I hope to be able to furnish an answer. Notice already, epistemologically, we have what we have called the fallibilist position. 
Notice it's not an absolutist position. I know I'm right, you're wrong. Nor is it a relative position. There is no truth, and what difference does it make? But rather the fallibilist position. If he doesn't know, he's going to say, I don't know. If he thinks he's right, he's going to say, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Let's have an argument or debate about it. To continue now. Were I considering only force, we think of Machiavelli, we think of Thrasymachus, and the effects of force, I should say, so long as a people is constrained to obey and does in fact obey, it does well. So as soon as it can shake off its yoke and succeeds in doing so, it does better. The fact that it has recovered its liberty by virtue of that same right by which it was stolen means either that it's entitled to resume it or that its theft by others was in the first place without justification. Quote, but the social order is a sacred right which serves as a foundation for all other rights. This is the very bedrock upon which Rousseau will build his argument. Let's read it again. But the social order is a sacred right which serves as a foundation for all other rights. This right, however, since it comes not by nature, must have been built upon conventions. This is what he's going to call a social contract. To discover what these conventions are is the matter of our inquiry. But before proceeding further, I must establish the truth of what I have so far advanced. Well, just now to summarize. Man is born free everywhere he's in change. The social order and its constraints arise from conventions and not from nature. In a family, I'm working now paragraphs three through seven. In a family, self-preservation binds children to their father. If the bond lasts after they become self-sufficient, then the family exists by choice and convention. So too with government, where both ruler and people cede their freedom only so far as it benefits them. Paragraphs 8 through 14. Some, con uh, some commentators, and now he's going to begin to turn to other political theorists like Gratis, take slavery as proof that political powers never exercise in the interest of the governed. In illogically deriving right from fact, they are in effect denying membership in the human race to most of humanity. Force, not nature, makes slaves. I'm with you now on page 57, and let's just read now from paragraphs 13, uh, uh, 12 into 13. A slave, Rousseau's comments on slavery were hypercritical for the abolitionist movement. A slave in fetters loses everything, even the desire to be freed from them. He grows to love his slavery as the companions of Ulysses grow to love their state of brutish uh, transformation. In some men, <coughs> excuse me, if some men are by nature slaves, the reason is that they've been made slaves against nature. Force made the first slaves. Cowardice has perpetuated the species. It's a compelling, almost aphoristic line, right? Um, and now let's continue. Paragraphs 15 through 18, those who take power cannot hold it forever unless they cast might as right, we think of Machiavelli, and obedience is duty. This is logical gibberish, however, for might is physical, not moral, and right would be invalid if it vanished whenever might changes hands. No man is under an obligation to obey any but the legitimate power of the state, legitimacy being conferred by agreement among the people. When we study our uh, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, we'll see how he draws directly in his arguments on government from this idea. Let's go to the next section, paragraphs 19 through 23. The argument that a people can subject themselves to a king as a slave does to a master is false. The slave surrenders his liberty for his subsistence, whereas the kind subsists off the, uh, whereas the king subsists off the people. To be legitimate, a government must not impose more hardship than it prevents, and it must be accepted freely by each new generation. I'm now with you on page 59. Let's take a look <clears throat> at paragraph 23. When a man renounces his liberty, he renounces his essential manhood, his rights, and even his duty as a human being. It's significant. Put it in your notes at 3a that we will have Jefferson using both the term rights as well as duty in Declaration of Independence. There's, there's a reason, there's a connection, obviously, back to Rousseau. There is no compensation possible for such complete renunciation. 
It is incompatible with man's nature, and to deprive him of his free will is to deprive his actions of all moral sanction. This is an important idea that we first came in contact with with Plato, but was made really clear for us in our study of Milton's Paradise Laws. Go back and take a look at those lectures on LearnStrong.net to be reminded. The convention, in short, which sets up on one side an absolute authority and on the other an obligation to obey without question is vain and meaningless. Uh, I mean, what a, what a controversial line, right? It is not obvious that where we, where we can demand everything, we owe nothing. Where there is no mutual obligation, no interchange of duties, it must surely be clear that the actions of a command a commanded cease <clears throat> to have any moral value. For how can it be maintained that my slave has any right against me when everything that he has is my property? It's a compelling question. His right being my right, it is absurd to speak of it as ever operating to my disadvantage. Let's continue. Paragraphs 24 through 30. The argument that a slave agrees to yield his liberty in exchange for his life implies that one man has the right to kill another in war. Wars, however, are between states, not individuals. We're justified in killing our enemies only while they fight as soldiers against us. That is, only when we cannot enslave them. Thus, the alleged right to enslave is based on the alleged right to kill and vice versa, proving that slavery has no validity. I'm over to page uh, 62 in paragraph 30. Just read it with me thus, just to finish this argument. In whatever way we look at the matter, the right to enslave has no existence, not only because it is without legal validity, but because the very term is absurd and meaningless. The words slavery and right are contradictory and mutually exclusive. Whether we be considering the relation of one man to another man or of an individual to a whole people, it is equally idiotic to say you and I have made a compact which represents nothing but loss to you and gain to me. I shall observe it so long as it pleases me to do so, and so shall you, until I cease to find it convenient. Powerful argument. Let's turn now to paragraphs 31 through 43. Conquest may turn individuals into slaves or masters, but kingship must be conferred by the people. A group comes to function as a people by virtue of a social contract. And this is where we'll begin now to, to have this conversation about the social contract in earnest. Social contract, enlisting the community strength on behalf of each individual while preserving individual freedom. Any abridgment of individual freedom cancels the contract. It's a, a, a powerful set of, of ideas. Paragraphs 44 through 47. <clears throat> the body politic, the entity created by and comprising the individual parties to the social contract, cannot bind itself to any agreement that would violate that contract. Any attack on one of its members is an attack on the whole body and vice versa. Paragraph 48 to 51. The body politic need not give a guarantee to its members as it exists at their will and for their benefit. An individual member's private and public interests may diverge, however. The body politic is therefore entitled to compel members' compliance with the general will. Excuse me, as we finish now the essay at paragraphs 52 through 54, we're going to be reminded that the passage from the state of nature to the civil state substitutes justice for instinct in individual behavior, creates a moral basis for action, and gives reason priority over desire. I'm with you on page 67, and let's look at paragraph 54. To the benefits conferred by the status of citizenship might be added that of moral freedom, which alone makes a man his own master. For to be subject to appetite is to be a slave, while to obey the laws laid down by society is to be free. Of course, Plato said this exact same thing in the Republic, didn't he? But I have already said enough on this point and am not concerned here with the philosophical meaning of the word liberty. To finish now, Paragraphs 55 to 61, with regard to property, physical strength, and the right of the first comer, are replaced by the rights of ownership under the social contract. Individuals cede their property to the state, and the state legitimates their claim to it. A person's title to land is based on the land being unoccupied, and on the owner taking only as much as he needs and will use, that is to say, restraint. And finally, paragraph 62, far from destroying natural equality, 
the social contract substitutes for it a moral and legal equality that compensates for people's physical and intellectual differences. Now, what are we going to say about a reading like this? Well, let's start with our big five. <clears throat> Epistemologically, that is to say what it is that we can know. What does this text suggest? Well, clearly, this is the fallibilist position. We might call it the romantic view, certainly the scientific view, epistemologically. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Notice, we don't have in Rousseau here an absolutist position, nor do we have an argument towards relativism, certainly a fallibilist position. But notice, I think, standing. And this is, like, to me, what makes Rousseau so, so important for Jefferson. But standing epistemologically behind everything he's saying, I believe, is this notion of a bit of humility that he's challenging, obviously, the status quo, and I think he knows that. And I think he knows that this is a, this is a demanding thing to do. And to that degree, very Promethean. But I think he's trying to do this in a very humble way as he's giving lots of examples of why he believes what he believes to be true. What does this text say about ontology? Well, notice, we are free. What a compelling idea. Psychologically, what does this say? We've got to fight against fear and anxiety and the desire to control others. Self-control is freedom. That's the key. Sociologically, what does this text say? We're as free as we allow ourselves to be. That's what we mean by the social contract. Finally, what does this text about, uh, say about theodicy? Well, I think the argument on slavery is a classic example. We choose and we allow evil. In much, of the, uh, in much of our existence, slavery here again comes to mind. It isn't natural, contrary to what Aristotle wanted to argue, but rather it is unnatural, because all humans are born free. 2A, messages, themes here. We have to choose to be free. We have to let others have their freedom as well. Another argument message here is that civil society is so much more important and better than natural society. It almost seems as if Rousseau is trending towards that notion that we are born mammals and